This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Okay, and we are live. Hi, everyone. I am Austin Huntington. I am this week's topic, or I don't know if it's this week, but I'm the uh, person for this conversation. Uh, I'm principal cellist of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. Uh, had a already busy start to our season with the IVCI, so uh, it's been quite a fun season so far. I've been in the position about, I think this is my eighth season, so just enough to start to know what I'm doing, but also uh, long enough that I'm still learning from everybody. So kind of talking about this topic of, you know, between the screen, uh, you know, what goes on behind the screen versus uh, on each side of the screen. I, uh, I thought that it might be interesting to explore this topic a little bit further since um, I have now sat on way too many audition committees to count. Uh, and now also I'm still taking auditions. So I thought it would be an interesting idea to talk about how my experience has changed as I have sat on more committees, taken auditions uh, after I've won my initial job at the ISO. Um, and if you have any questions, definitely feel free to uh, type them in and I hope we will get them. So one of the biggest things when it comes to auditioning that I have started to realize is just how important it is to make an individual um, impact on the committee. Um, somebody once said something to me that has really stuck with me. This person now has a, a very fantastic job and is one of the most incredible musicians I know. Um, they once said, you don't win an audition because you play everything solidly. You win an audition because somebody says, holy crap, did you hear that, insert excerpt, that Brahms concerto, that, um, that Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and what he was getting at was this idea that, of course, all your excerpts have to be solid. Um, let's say if we rank them out of a, a scale of 10, every excerpt has to be at least an eight out of 10. It has to be in tune, has to be in rhythm, has to be all of that good sound, everything. But what he was getting at is, let's say you are at a crossroads of what to practice. Um, let's say you have a seven out of 10 that you need to practice and you have one that you feel very comfortable with, the one that kind of suits your strengths better, a 10 out of 10. His point was actually go towards that 10 out of 10 and make it an 11 out of 10. Um, because when somebody, and I've also found this to be the case myself, when somebody plays you know, very well, it doesn't really stand out per se, and that's not in a negative way. It doesn't really stand out in terms of if they do everything right. If they have, for example, one of the best sounds that I've heard, if they have one of the best phrasings in a Brahms symphony, for example, there was uh, somebody in our one of our first violin auditions who they played the solo from the Brahms uh, first symphony. And what really struck me was the fact that for the first time now, it was like, oh, that's how it's supposed to go because they were so convincing in it. Of course, everything else was, you know, fantastic otherwise. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the first kind of transition point in this talk is be yourself and lean into your strengths kind of thing. Um, and this is also something not to jump around a little bit through this transition, but it's also something that a lot of people have asked myself and I've also asked people when I was taking auditions as well, you know, I'm auditioning for X orchestra. Do I try to match what I know X orchestra likes? Um, like for example, I'm auditioning for Cleveland. Do I try to play lighter? Do I try to do this? Do I try to change my playing? Um, and the answer is no obviously, because, and that's kind of the clear answer, but it's something that should be said. Um, but if you try to be somebody who you aren't, then it gets very tricky because what happens if you win that job? 
then you basically have to change everything about you playing. Um, and who knows if that'll make you happy. Maybe it'll make you happy, maybe not, but um, it always feels like you're putting on a little bit of a facade to me. Um, so let's take a step back. Um, and I apologize if I'm rambling. I just have a lot of uh, thoughts on the topic because uh, it's something that I'm currently going through as well. So maybe this is also me working out everything in my head. Uh, so welcome to my therapy session. Uh, but basically, uh, to give a little bit of history, I won the ISO job in 2015. It was the fourth audition I took. Um, one of the things that I found initially when auditioning, and maybe this isn't necessarily related 100% to this specific topic, but one of the things that I found initially that had a huge impact on my success in auditions was the ability to feel comfortable on stage. Um, somebody, I'm going to keep saying somebody, but I don't want to call anybody out without their permission of using their words because maybe they think they sound dumb after saying this. I think it's an incredible quote, but um, the idea that winning auditions is the least musical way to win a musical job. Um, and to a certain extent, that is true. Um, you basically have to show up, you have to think, I mean, I thought a lot of times it's about this checklist of things to do, you know, in the Beethoven Fifth Symphony excerpt, you have to, you know, play exactly in time, not rush, not drag. You have to have beautiful phrasing that aligns with the, the double bass part that's underneath it as well. You have to play in tune, obviously, because it's very difficult in E-flat major. You have to make sure all three excerpts are in the same tempo, etc. And so one of the things that really helped me is one of my former teachers talked to me a lot about making sure that I knew that these were actual pieces of music. So what does that mean? Obviously, they're actually parts of real pieces of music. But what I found to be incredibly helpful was to actually just sit down, uh, put on like a little Bluetooth speaker with five different recordings and just play along with them. And then after I'm done with the excerpt, listen to the rest of the movement, see where that excerpt fits in in the movement. Because what I kind of connecting now to this topic, what I realized quickly was when we listen to the excerpts behind the screen as the committee, we're not just hearing, and forgive me if you've heard this before, because I've, I heard this, but I didn't necessarily understand it until I experienced it, which is kind of also a theme of this talk, is the committee members aren't listening to just your part, because there's not just going to be, for example, cellists on your committee. And for example, we just had a cello audition. We had, I think, four or five cellists there, and the rest were string players, some principal, some section. And so even in that, where it's you know just limited to the string section, we aren't hearing just your part. We're hearing how you interact with the bass line, for example, I was talking before, how you know how you lead into the viola part coming off of that excerpt, how you, for example, play this duet with the violins against uh, the counter melody. Um, and so in that way, you need to think about it as real pieces, not only because we need to think about it from the musical standpoint, but also because everybody else in the committee is thinking about it like a real piece of music. Um, I think one of the trickiest things to do is get in that mindset because when we sit in a practice room, like my first audition was for some principal of a good orchestra, and I realized quickly that I couldn't get through everything in a day. So I would spend basically half an hour with each excerpt, which added up to basically having to split the list into three days. Um, and I get so intensely focused on one excerpt, you know, I'd be obsessing over one shift, what, uh, you know, obsessing over the sound at the beginning of the Brahms symphony, all that fun stuff to the point where it ended up being like a gymnastics routine that you had to go through. And while I think there is some merit to that, I, it, to be com completely transparent, I didn't advance in any audition uh, for the first three times. Um, and that was because that also affects you mentally, it affected me mentally, where if I would miss something that I thought was incredibly important on that little checklist of items, let's say I missed the, the, the shift in the Brahms symphony, the da 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 yum, da da If I missed that, I would feel like, oh shoot, I've already like, gotten one check off, I haven't met all the checks. 
I would distract me, I would miss more stuff, it would just automatically go downhill because I thought it's almost like missing a jump in a gymnastics routine or a, an ice skating routine as well. But what was really interesting about the ISO audition and then also the three auditions that I've taken after that have been that if I miss something, that's fine. People miss things. I mean, you miss things in performance, whether people admit it or not. I've missed that shift in a performance, uh, not a couple times because we're so used to playing it, but at least once I missed that shift in performance. So it's it's one of those where in a real piece of music, if you miss something, it's fine. Like nobody's really going to bat an eye at it because everybody misses something. In an audition, people think it's the end of their life kind of thing. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing with this idea that, you know, it's a real piece of music is that you need to kind of employ the idea of fake it till you make it in terms of experience when you're playing. And that sounds really bad to say out loud because that sounds like I'm telling everybody to go commit musical fraud. But instead what I'm saying is a lot of times if you look at the, you know, the big five orchestra lists or any of the lists that, you know, you can ask yourself, they're, are they trying to weed out people who don't have the experience of playing an entire Brahms symphony or all of Heldenleben or all of that? that some of the ways to tell that are like do they ask for the entire symphony do they ask for no measure numbers do they ask for uh, a lot of sight reading so when it comes to that you need to convince the committee that you've played it with orchestra you know everything that's going on you know all the intricacies um, for example one of the big ones and I can go more into specific excerpts uh, if people would like later but one of the big ones that I found is the third moon of Beethoven five, when we have the trio, the dun da 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 when the violas come in to instantaneously drop back, because then all the violas on the committee will be like, oh yeah, that's where we come in. Because they're violas, maybe they don't know where to come in. But one of the biggest things, like that's, you know, takes two seconds of brain power when we're practicing it, but can go a long way in terms of convincing somebody that you actually know what's going on instead of just playing the music. Um, because there are little things that happen. For example, in the Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream, we've played that for family concerts a bunch of times here uh, at the ISO. And so I've had the, I've been very fortunate to be able to play it a bunch of times within the orchestra. Um, and playing it in the orchestra versus playing it as an excerpt are very different. It's way less stress from playing in the actual orchestra because it's you you kind of come off of the constant 16th notes from other sections you grab onto that and then it's a lot easier to play lighter to play a little bit more elegantly there um so yeah actually we uh we interrupt this service for a quick question we have a question from uh, Gabriel saying, hi, huge fan, had a question about resumes. I have an undergrad in education, but master's in performance. Any tips on making it past the resume round? Anything that would get an immediate no? Thanks. So this is actually a really interesting question because a lot of auditions, so basically let's, let's go even farther back. Every orchestra operates differently. So I can only talk about the orchestras that I've been a part of, aka just the ISO, but also talking to principals of all the orchestras when I was trying to figure out how to do the ISO auditions for the cellos. Um, for the ISO, we don't screen resumes. We sometimes screen resumes to see if there are any outstanding candidates. For example, people who have um, been the runner-up at an audition within the past year, somebody who has an equivalent job or just slightly below a job. So for example, we're in Indianapolis, so somebody from Nashville Symphony applied. Uh, we could pre-advance into the semi-final round, just past the first round. Um, but we don't really screen for resumes in terms of, you know, we don't want this person to show up because we believe that anybody who wants to come audition should have the ability to. In terms of what I could see as being slightly annoying with resumes and annoying as in like you're not doing anything wrong it's just a matter of you know can you can you make it easier on the committee is the format of the resumes because when we have 150 200 resumes to go through um, even if we aren't necessarily looking for people to um, to cut from the resume round the first thing is 
um, make it as simple as possible. Um, and I think this is how it differs from the real world resumes. Don't put, you know, all these things about, you know, for example, in my resume, if I put principal of Indianapolis symphony, and then I list like a paragraph about my responsibilities, definitely don't do that. We've seen that. Um, and then list it in order at the very top to the bottom should be in the, the sections in the order of, um, what is most important in an orchestra job and then going down what is least important. And so for me personally, the most important is orchestra experience. I want to see from a resume, if you've played an orchestra, if you've been subbing in an orchestra, even hell, even if it's like, for example, like the, the IU Indiana University Symphony Orchestra section, I want to see that you've at least played in an orchestra before, which sounds kind of like common sense because I doubt anybody would be auditioning for an orchestra, a professional orchestra of this level, if they haven't played in an orchestra previously, even if, um, even if it's a student orchestra or a community orchestra. So I'd put that. I would also not list every little detail. Um, don't go super far back in dates. I usually try to keep my personal resume within five years, unless there's something really substantial in a category. Um, for example, I won a couple of competitions that uh, I think mean a lot to me and possibly a committee. And so I just list those two competitions, even though they were 2011, 2012. Um, but within that, you know, I, if you're auditioning as a master's student for um, the ISO, for example, I don't want to necessarily see that you played in your middle school orchestra. So just little things like that. Um, try to just stay within the first five years or the, the latest five years. To be honest, I, and this is just speaking on the ISO's part, um, and I'm sure a lot of other orchestras like this, it doesn't really matter what your degree is in. We have our, for example, our uh, second bassoonist actually has his bachelor's in engineering, um, and then I think master's in music, um, whether it's performance or um, one of the other music degrees. But it, for me, it doesn't matter what your degree is in. What matters is you know how you play and if you could be a good member of the section. So for me, there isn't anything for an immediate no. I would say, and maybe this gets into resume horror stories, I've had somebody sent a biography with a picture. Like, again, keep in mind, when they print these out for us to look through like a whole packet, it's black and white. So just like this grainy black and white photo, which A, you're not supposed to send because we're not supposed to you know, attach faces to names or anything like that. So that, and then the biography started with, uh, so and so is the greatest cellist in his generation from X, Y, and Z country. Has been lauded by these newspapers, and just like that's that's not for an orchestral audition. I want to see you know your name, address, all that fun stuff. Orchestral experience. I would say education, awards, and honors. Uh, you can put like music festivals would be a good point if you don't already put the music festivals in the orchestral experience. So like if you go to Aspen or. Banff or uh, Round Top, anything like that, put that in orchestral, uh, or not orchestral, sorry, um, festival experience, and then put your references. Always include at least two to three references. These can be uh, teachers that you've worked with. These can be uh, musicians that you've collaborated with. Um, my, my references, for example, on my resume are uh, two of my former teachers and then a principal of a, a big orchestra that I have done a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with as well. So just people who, if they call, they can be like, oh yeah, this person, like don't, <laughs> don't put Yo-Yo Ma's references on your resume because he, unless you know him personally, um, it wouldn't be much of a help. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, but I, I would say the main thing is just making sure that it's as easy to read for the committee because I can definitely see um, committee members thumbing through the resumes and if it's unorganized, if it's different fonts, if it's different whatever, um, then that can, that can subtly or subconsciously um, lead someone to believe that, about unprofessionalism. Like this person didn't even have the, the idea to like list the resume in order or to format it or anything. So just making it as clean and cut as possible. That makes sense. Cool. So, um, yeah, and just if you have any questions, just go ahead and submit them. We'll uh, kind of build that into the topic at hand as well. Um, so the other thing to think about, um, getting back to, to our initial topic about um, the, the two sides of the screen, 
when you are preparing for an audition, um, one of the biggest things that we have to struggle with is how do you manage your time? And so um, this is again something that even now I personally struggle with, um, especially having a, a full-time job preparing for auditions. But one of the biggest things that I think should be, shouldn't be taken for granted is 15 minutes can get you a lot of good work done. Um, and so if, for example, you have a class and you have 15 minutes between class, then go practice, go play through a resume, or sorry, <laughs> still on the resume question, go play through an excerpt um, because you should be ready to go at any minute um, if you needed to. Uh, basically, and this is something that I've learned the hard way is if you are in an audition, sometimes it's a matter of just, you know, the committee gets behind, sometimes not. Um, I have experiences on both sides. Uh, uh, you might be waiting around a while or you might get in there and be like the, the person who's in charge might tell you, you know, so-and-so canceled, we need you ready to go in like 20 minutes. And for those of you like me, 20 minutes is not a long time to kind of get in the audition mindset. If you're walking in, especially the last one I took was in um, the spring, it was still cold, my hands were cold, I hadn't eaten. So uh, getting ready into that mindset is really good. So practicing in the worst case scenario will prepare you for a lot of things. And this is kind of one of those things, uh, kind of on the topic of feeling comfortable on stage, because one of the most important things for a committee member is to feel like you're at ease when you're listening as well. Um, because again, this is kind of tying into what I said before about a very unmusical way to win a job, a musical job is if somebody gets on stage and is super nervous, their bow shaking, the vibrato is all tight, they miss a bunch of shifts. We, we aren't rooting for you to miss those shifts. It's one of those where I like I actually get nervous when I hear somebody playing and I can hear them nervous. Um, and while there are people who, you know, have a lot of issues with nerves, um, I feel like personally what I've found, and again, this is everybody might be different. What I found is the nerves go away, the more mindless it can be for preparation. And again, that doesn't sound great, but basically if you're able to wake up at 2 a.m. with a hangover, cold hands, uh, don't even know where your cello is, you should be able to play through the entire list at I would say 85% of your um, musical capacity, technical capacity. So obviously if you have cold hands, you're gonna maybe miss something, but you should be able to do that without any questions asked. So when you're preparing for an audition, Obviously, you go through, you prepare everything. Um, one of the biggest things is just making sure that you're ready to go with any excerpt in any order at any time. So one of the things that I like to do um, is we have 20 minute breaks at the ISO here. So if I'm preparing for an audition, in that 20 minute break, I'll you know go socialize, hang out, maybe ask the conductor a question, and then I'll go on stage early or I'll go down to practice room early and I'll just play through an excerpt and I won't fix anything if I miss it. I'll just mentally think, what did I not do there that I wanted to do next time? And then I'll apply that after the rehearsal when I go to practice, that's when I'll apply that. So what that does is when you're taking an audition, you aren't going to fix what you miss at the audition unless specifically asked by usually the music director or one of the committee people. Um, so. For example, let's say you're playing something and then you miss something. You won't get a chance to fix that unless somebody asks you, can you try that again? And so that's why mimicking the conditions of an audition are inherently that much more important. So just play it through and then remove yourself from the situation and then fix it kind of thing. Same thing goes for um, playing for friends. And what I found, uh, especially after having a position is people come to you to play for you a lot um, and while we'll, we'll get to that in a sec but when you're preparing for an audition play for as many people as possible um, even if you don't necessarily 
let's say, trust them with comments. So even if it's, you know, for your neighbor who doesn't know the difference between a cello and cellophane, um, still play for them because the act of getting nervous, getting your heart rate up, playing for other people helps you normalize the audition experience as well. So then you can take your head out of, you know, what am I going to do technically? And you can actually focus on what you're going to do musically. So a lot of the musicality will be baked in at that point because you need to, you know, do all the phrasing that you're going to do during the audition. But then when the audition comes, you're not nervous about missing stuff. You're not nervous about starting anything like that. But instead you can focus on the actual musicality of the audition. So, uh, we've been talking a lot about preparing for the audition part of it. What I think, what I didn't expect is preparing for sight reading as well. Um, so this is not something that we do at the ISO, but one of the biggest things that, uh, one of the scariest things for me personally, uh, and I've only been asked for it once at an audition this past year. Um, and what it was is we had the Brahms third symphony excerpt. And then what they had us do is we finished the excerpt in the slow movement. And then they had us go for one more phrase. And what I thought was really interesting is, you know, when you're preparing an audition, you always ask, why do they ask for certain excerpts? Why do they ask for certain things? Because nobody asks for something just for the sake of asking for it. So for the Brahms Third Symphony, the reason they asked you to go on was to see if you've played it before, I think, A, because it, I think they were looking for somebody who had a little bit more experience with playing. So they don't want somebody who's never played Brahms Third Symphony before, which is own kind of worms. Um, but they also wanted to see how somebody did under intense pressure because now you don't have that luxury of having everything fully prepared. So when it comes to sight reading, take as much time as possible to get ready to get in the right mindset. Um, the biggest thing is everybody, uh, usually in the section who is here in the sight reading, maybe, you know, if I'm hearing a file in sight reading, I won't necessarily know it super well, but we all have the music in front of us make sure you play the right notes in the right rhythm, even if it's slower. Uh, we'll never, I, unless it's a, you know, <laughs> mildly satanic orchestra, uh, they won't ask you for an impossible thing to sight read. So the main thing is just take as much time as you need, get your heart rate down, um, sing it in your head first, make sure you have all the accidentals. And then once you sing it all the way through in your head, then start playing it. Um, we have another question. So we have a question from Eunice Kim. Hi, Austin. What is your warm-up routine before a concert or audition? So um, those are two different things for me. So for the audition, uh, there are usually, I hate saying this because it makes me sound uh, pretentious, but there are two schools of thought for uh, audition warm-up. Do you warm up with the excerpts or do you warm up with nothing about the excerpts? Um, because the idea is, you know, do you want to remove your mindset from getting nervous about excerpts? Do you want to remove all that? Or do you want to make sure you have everything down? And personally for me, I am of the second mindset where I need to warm up with the excerpts. Otherwise I, um, I find myself getting nervous because I need to make sure I have it that day kind of thing. So that when I go on stage, I'm like, oh, I've already hit this shift today. I can just hit it again kind of thing. So my warm routine usually consists of, I'll start with very slow, long bows. Um, is what I find, especially when you get up to like 16 counts per bow, up to 20 counts or so, you really start to um, activate a lot of the muscles that are controlled with stabilizing the arm and really getting that, that smooth, smooth bow change as well at the tip and the frog. Um, that's, we could talk more about that because the, the reason I think this is so important is because the cello is inherently a lyrical instrument and a lot of the excerpts that they ask for, um, at least the excerpts that I find myself having the strongest time with um, in terms of my own personal playing are the lyrical excerpts because I, I resonate with a lot of them a lot more. Maybe I'm more used to playing them. But one of the biggest things is you can play the most beautiful sound you want, but if you hear bow changes every single time you change the bow or your bow starts to shake, then that's distracting for the committee. And it kind of takes away from any musical thing that you're doing. So long bows on every string also helps warm up the cello because my cello is, how old is my cello? 283-ish, 282. Um, so I really do feel like 
it needs to get warmed up as well, especially if it's been traveling the day before. So that helps it. Um, I'll warm up my vibrato by doing very slow vibrato on each note, trying to connect the vibrato. Um, and then uh, I'll do the uh, the Eric Kim special. I studied with Eric Kim uh, the past couple of years during the pandemic to get a master's degree. And one of the, uh, the things that I still do every day is this Kosman exercise which is the one, four, three, four, one, four, three, four, and then one, four, two, four. And then his little twist is you switch, uh, you shift down to two, two, four, three, four, because the fourth and third finger are usually a lot weaker than all the other fingers. And so getting that, um, switching instead of doing one, three, two, three, it helps strengthen the fourth finger. But I find especially in uh, warming up, it gets the whole hand warmed up super quickly. And there are a couple scales. Then I'll move into the excerpts and again, like I was kind of alluding to with like being prepared for everything. This is anticipating that I have maybe half an hour, 40 minutes to warm up, which is usually the, the typical amount of time that I found that you have to warm up in an audition. Then I'll go through, I'll start with um, maybe going against common sense. I'll start with an excerpt that I find I do well or that I'm comfortable with or that I'm strongest with because half of the audition in my mind is a mental game. And so you need to put yourself at ease. And so play something that you're really comfortable with first to come almost get yourself warmed up, get your mind warmed up, your, um, your emotional state warmed up as well. And then I, what I do is, do I have, I don't have my binder here of excerpts, but I basically have these little red brackets over things that need to be drilled. Um, and so it might be that shift in the Brahms first symphony. It might be, um, the oh, sorry, Brahms Second Symphony. It might be the first run of Don Juan. Just little things that I don't feel as comfortable with, but I need to practice. And what I'll do is I'll go over them very, very slowly, very intentionally, making sure I don't have any tension at all as I'm shifting or as I'm playing. Basically, the most relaxed version of it, because you need to get yourself in that mindset. It's almost like a, a meditation beforehand. Um, and so, after I do those, then I'll go through the excerpts that I haven't touched, I'll just play them through very slowly, very softly. Um, and that's the main thing is I don't really play through excerpts. I don't per perform the excerpts until you get on stage because I find myself actually getting tired out very easily because you're having your own microscope on top of your excerpts. And so you don't want to tire yourself out by, you know, going through the whole audition process before you actually have to get on there. You have to save yourself for what's on stage. And the reason why I do that is because I have had auditions where I am in the room a lot longer than I think I will be. Let's put it that way. And so I get done warming up, get done preparing, and an hour goes by. And I'm just kind of trying to stay in that golden point of being warmed up and not being warmed up. Um, because you don't really know where they are on the round. They don't know if it's the person before you or if you still have three people before you. Um, the audition that this happened at, I ended up waiting about two and a half or three hours before I played. Um, and luckily I brought coffee, I brought water and I brought a granola bar. And so I was able to eat as, because I, I asked the personal manager to let me know when they took the other person back. So I knew I'd have about 20 minutes so then I could get rewarmed up again. And so for me that, um, that's why I like to practice slowly and softly. So I don't use any more energy than I have to. Um, of course, you still do the same phrasing. You still do the same intensity of phrasing and uh, sound as well. You don't basically just sit back in your chair and warm up like, like somebody who um, has given up already. So you still go through the whole process, but then um, you just kind of Make sure to conserve as much as you can. Um, for a concert, it's basically similar. I do the same, you know, long bows, cosmic exercise, maybe a scale, some vibrato stuff. And then I essentially have lined up the, the stuff that I need to drill again. Um, and so for me, for example, if I'm wearing it for an orchestra concert, for example, we just had IBCI, the violin competition in Indianapolis. Um, thank God we didn't have corn gold because I'd have to warm up a long time for that. Um, for example, Sibelius concerto, we have, uh, I have a couple of solos in the last movement, even though they're not terribly difficult. I just want to make sure I play them through, make sure that I play them softly and get ready to go. So basically just playing through the stuff that I want to, uh, touch anyways. 
um, making sure that I am as prepared for it as I can. So, and then we have a question from Dylan. Hi, Dylan. Hi, Austin. Any advice on making hide and D or any other scary piece or excerpt like Mozart 35 feel good and comfy instead of feeling like I'd rather be playing almost anything else in that moment? Um, this is an eternal question of mine. So actually, Mozart 35 is one of my least favorite excerpts. I don't know why, just I don't agree with it. Um, I, my, maybe my playing doesn't agree with it. Um, I, I can get by, but it's always a struggle and always one of the excerpts I you know, have to focus on the most. So for me, a lot of it is this idea of 80-20 practice. So um, there's an idea I, during the pandemic, I got super into running, um, endurance running, like marathons and stuff. And there's an idea in endurance training about 80-20 uh, preparation 80 percent for running it's 80 percent of your miles are done at slow very easy pace 20 percent is at you know fast pace your goal pace whatever um and i feel like practicing is a lot of that way so the majority of what you do should be slow even when you feel like you know um the excerpts for example let's take um mozart 35 even when you know that you know the excerpt the majority of your practice should still be slow and so um, one of the, I mean, there are different techniques we can talk about, for example, doing rhythms, doing reverse bowing. Um, one of the things that I found for overly technical excerpts like Mozart 35 is to come up with groupings, um, little kind of semi agogic accents. So for example, in Mozart 35, the sync, da 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 actually go towards the second one. Um, and in those groupings, you kind of break it down into smaller pieces. So I always do, for example, one beat plus the next beat. So da 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 da, um, and just practice that. It's almost like a velocity exercise kind of thing. So you get really good at practicing that one beat, and then you do the same thing for the entire snake, for example, and then you put two of those together, four of those together, etc., until you have the entire thing. Um, the the trick with that one is basically you're training yourself to go slowly um, and to play it very cleanly but then when you build it up in tempo um, you don't have to focus on the entire thing so you get every beat to the same standard um, for me at least that that works uh, when it comes to the other stuff like the, the rest of the excerpt i try not to think about the technique which sounds kind of counterintuitive because it's all about technique. So, you know, the idea about, you know, why do they ask for Mozart 35? It's cleanliness, it's lightness, it's the stroke, it's the, even if it's especially not rushing kind of thing. So after you've practiced, I'm assuming, you know, even if you practiced it, it still feels kind of scary. Um, try to make, exaggerate the phrasing a lot more because also what I found uh, sitting on auditions, people who I've talked to afterwards basically being like I was you know, a little bit on the monotone side, they thought that they were doing extreme phrasing. And so over-exaggerating phrasing, um, I think really helps with that. So for example, the um, whatever phrasing you end up doing for that, really focus on that and don't focus on the stroke, don't focus on the the hands uh, unless you're specifically working on the technique if you're not working on the technique then get into the mindset of just phrasing because I feel like a lot of the time kind of what you're alluding to is wanting to play anything at that moment other than that is that's not a, a technical issue that's not a, a hand issue that's a mental issue and so if you're focusing on the phrasing you're not going to step on your own toes a lot more than you know you normally would so if you focus on the phrasing in hide and d for example rather than you know oh shit i have to go all the way up the cello and not miss any notes because then it's very obvious um then i find i actually miss a lot less stuff if i relax and focus on phrasing um there's actually a really interesting master class that i played for steven isserlis where i played arpeggioni and it kind of links in very well with that so i was playing i was very intent on getting every note i have this uh, i had this issue i've been working on it a lot about my shoulders coming up and turning into a turtle a little bit as I play. And so he just like stopped me after I played, I started the phrase again and he was just like, 
nobody wants to see this. Nobody wants to see you be nervous. People want to be drawn into the music. And so I want you to look up, find somebody and connect with them as you play kind of thing. So I was just awkwardly like staring at people's eyes while I was playing arpeggioni. But what was really interesting is it actually made me feel a lot more at home, made me feel like I could actually express myself because that's kind of getting back to the whole like being musical rather than unmusical with an audition is you're trying music is supposed to connect people not divide people with you know like oh he missed this thing he didn't hit this thing kind of thing so it gets back to you know why music in the beginning so that's a very flowery answer um in terms of a lot of ornamentation in my description but that the main thing is basically just focus on phrasing focus on on sound focus on everything else besides um the technique because i'm trusting that the technique has already gotten to the point where um you don't really have to worry about it as much it's now getting over your own mental blocks about that um and i found that's the best way to do it um question from connor hi connor uh hey austin what is your general approach to learning a new piece of music either solo or excerpts it feels difficult to find a routine for attacking a lyrical versus a technical passage so I kind of do what all the teachers in my life have told me not to do for learning a new piece. Um, unless it's like a new commission, the first thing I do is I just like pound the absolute crap out of it on my Spotify playlist. So I have, for example, like uh, for this classical season uh, coming up, I have a Spotify playlist with all the pieces that we're playing that have recording us on Spotify. And I basically just listen to them nonstop. Um, and I try to listen to, you know, three or four different recordings so I don't get set on one interpretation or anything like that. But the first step for me is just having it in my ear because um, the last thing I want to do is not necessarily realize I'm learning a wrong note or, you know, I'm not seeing where in the piece of music my part fits. And this is especially true in the orchestra part because I am absolutely horrible at score reading. Um, if it's something super important like a, a trial week or um, a big week coming with the ISO, a piece that I don't really know super well, then I'll pull out the score and I'll be like, okay, I need to line up with these people when I have this, you know, the oboes have the melody kind of thing. But I find the, the express version is listening to recordings and trying to always label your part in terms of what what role does my part have here um and kind of going from there um so that's the that's the main thing with like the in general the lyrical and technical where it branches off from lyrical and technical for lyrical i i'm a big music theory uh nerd which kind of goes against what i just said about the um not being able to read a score because you kind of need to do that if you ever want to go into anything more advanced with music theory um but for me it's finding the strong points and the weak points in a phrase and always thinking about the phrase as uh, going somewhere or coming away from something. So the first thing, it's almost like a telephone pole where we either need to come away from one of the telephone poles and day crescendo or go towards the next telephone pole and crescendo towards that. Um, because there should never be any stagnation involved in, in phrasing because unless it's specifically asked for. Um, so for that, that'd be the first step. And one of the ways that I really like finding this is just after I have it in my head, um, I'll just sing it kind of thing. For example, the second name for Dvorak, uh, my teacher at the time had me sing the phrase through and then say, you know, this is where the phrase starts. This is where the phrase ends. And then if there's any notes in there that are really, um, let's just call them juicy notes, notes that I think are really important or I think that are really special, then I will um, find a way to bring those out musically, whether it's, you know, going to them suddenly softer or crescendoing to them, that kind of thing. Um, and at the core of a lyrical passage, I would make sure that my sound is always there as I never want to necessarily learn a lyrical passage and just learn the notes, learn the phrasing, but then have to apply my sound afterwards, basically making sure that everything is baked in at the same time. For a technical passage, it's all about the metronome for me. Um, I hate technical passages that are very rhythmic heavy. Um, not because I feel like I can't do them, I just feel like because it takes a lot more time to, to get comfortable with them. Um, and so 
more so with lyrical passages, more so than the lyrical passages, I feel like technical passages, you have to make sure everything's lined up rhythmically first. Um, because, especially when you're playing in a bigger group, the most important thing is that you have the rhythm right. Because the wrong note at the right time is better than the right note at the wrong time. Let's put it that way. Um, and maybe that's the coward's approach, but that's that's the way that I've always thought about it. Um, so for me, it's starting off and always making sure that you never take on more than you can chew tempo-wise as well. So kind of what we were talking about with the previous question, making sure that we always um, go at a slower tempo than we think we can go at. Um, because we should always feel like, and this is the same thing, we can think about this with excerpts as well, you need to be able to play it faster than you actually play it, have you know an initial 10% of speed or velocity at the end where if somebody says, you know, oh, can I hear Mendelssohn faster? Or if the conductor, you know, on the first rehearsal takes, you know, Das Rheingold a lot faster than you thought it would be, then just be prepared for that as well. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a rambly way of answering that. But the main thing is just making sure that um, we are uh, cognizant of where it fits in as well, because I feel like um, that informs a lot of the phrasing decisions, informs a lot of the technical decisions as well. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Also, uh, with technical passages, making sure that you're always relaxed, because I feel like technical passages are way harder if you are tense. And it's kind of like, you know, you now have resistance. So if you have a car going 100 miles an hour in a vacuum versus a tunnel with wind coming at you, that tunnel with wind coming at you, that wind is your uh, tension. And so if you have that tension, you can't really go as fast. You can't really do as much as you want to do there. So hopefully that helps. Uh, we have another question from Dylan. Do you have any advice for practicing octaves or tenths? No, I do not. I hate them. Just kidding. Uh, no, I don't. I actually do hate them. I find practicing these parts in Haydn D3 moon or Prokofiev symphony moon contretemps, I get so fatigued and cramped even at a slow tempo that I have to stop. So, depends on the octaves or tenths. For me, one of the things that has to be said, especially as an orchestral musician, the first thing is building up your thumb callus. Um, and maybe I'm a little ashamed to admit it. Um, if you play in an orchestra long enough, your thumb callus is way smaller than if you practice chamber orchestra or um, uh, solo music. And so, for example, I'm uh, about two and a half weeks out from a Brahms double with the ISO, and we have some octaves and some stuff in there. And what I've been doing is literally going up and down the cello, pressing with my thumb to purposely get a thumb callus back. Because I, I have one, but it's you know it makes it a lot easier if you don't have to be in pain every time you play. So that's me selfishly saying that as the first part. And then, uh, for example, the hide and D third movement, I would basically always feel like you have an anchor note and a, um, I can't remember what the anchor note, I don't know what the other note would be called. Let's say an anchor and a line um, note if we're talking about like nautical themed tense. So your anchor note would always be the thumb. So because it can take more of the weight then be much lighter on the top note. So what I find, and then it kind of also inherently because we're always taught to bring out the bottom note on, a, on an octave on a tenth a little bit more. So always make sure that we feel like we're grounded on the thumb and then lighter on the third finger. And then as we move, um, as we shift, when you practice slowly, practice releasing the tension in the shift. So for example, if I do the uh, Dvorak octaves, instead of practicing uh, all in once, I'll practice releasing the tension going to the next octave, even though it seems kind of silly to do because in the end it's basically a glissando. It teaches you that when you go between these octaves, you shouldn't be pressing because when you press, that's when you fatigue the muscles a lot quicker. Um, so again, maybe the idea of the telephone poles, but now with technique, uh, reusable, right? Um, where we have tension on each side, the inherent tension that we need to, you know, keep the arm up, keep the octave going. And then during the shift, the, we have this slack on the, the telephone line that should be representative of the shift. We're basically just floating over and then re-engaging the tension each time. So for me, that that's the biggest thing with octaves, just kind of tension release, not pressing with the top note as much. Um, and then making sure that I, I mean, one of the other things that might not mean that much to, to other people, 
but I like to have like two different parts that I'm practicing at the same time. It's called like a practicing superset kind of thing, where I'll practice the octaves. And once I'm tired from that, then I'll go practice, you know, the beginning of hide and D to give my octave fingers a break and then, but still get work done, still have this musically in my mind. And then once I'm done practicing that, then I'll go back to it and kind of alternate between those two so that you're still getting practice and you're still in the musical mindset, um, but you don't really fatigue as quickly. So. And then we have a question from Richard. Hi, Austin. Do you have any pointers with regards to timing in the divorce? Or sorry, Beethoven 9, Rested Seed excerpt. Thanks. Uh, yes. The arrested in itself, and maybe this is, you know, what English pit tell English teachers say never to do about, like, you know, from the dawn of time, you never start a paper like that. But a recitative uh, in its nature is uh, coming from an opera. And it's basically attaching words to it. It's moving the plot along. Um, it's very flexible tempo-wise. Um, I like to point out the parts that I have um, stagnation and movement. Um, and usually the stagnation parts are um, the parts that are a little bit more important. For example, the beginning. Dun, dun, da, 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 da. Dun, 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 da, 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 and then you can move it kind of thing um, so I think the, the tricky thing with this though comes down to a lot of times musicians are con as long as you play it convincingly musicians on the committee are totally fine with it um, unless they're super you know it has to be this way uh, I find the people who care most about this are conductors because they want you to play it their way even though you don't know what their way is until you actually play with them which is a slightly frustrating rub um so i would say if you take any time give it back and if you move forward make sure to you know give back the time that you moved forward in the end so it should all about equal out in the end um so in addition to that, and it gets kind of it gets tricky when I, when I don't have a chill in front of me to, to demonstrate. Uh, maybe I'll grab it in a sec if if I'm not making a lot of sense. But <clears throat> the first part of the recit is fine because that's basically coming off of this diminished chord and you know uh, a lot of eighth notes. You basically can do whatever you want in terms of taking time and moving forward as long as it's within reason. Um, as we have these interjections, usually it's like a little chorale, and then you have to find out, do I match the chorale? Do I take over the chorale? For example, the da 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 That's one of those where you take the, um, I don't want to say emotion, but take, take the affect of the chorale, and then start your next entrance at that affect rather than for example there might be a corral and then you interrupt them dun dun um is one of those uh, halfway through or so so that's the first thing second thing is always start playing exactly in time with the metronome when you're practicing it um because what i found a lot of people do is take something like what i just said about you know it's a rest that you're supposed to be free with it um, and they distort the rhythm to the point where it doesn't really make a lot of sense what, what's, on, uh, what's on the music. And so um, focusing on the agogic accents, the accents that are inherently giving structure to each measure. Uh, so for example, like if we're in a three, four measure, uh, you shouldn't accent two unless there's an accent on it kind of thing. This should always make sense in terms of you know what's on the page. So start from that baseline of, um, of exactly in tempo, and then question, do I want to move forward here, not move forward here? And a lot of times it's kind of written into the music. If we have a lot of eighth notes, the da 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 um, it kind of cascades downward, cascades forward. So uh, it's, it's one of those where, yes, we need freedom, but start from that kind of variant in time uh, baseline and then allow the music to tell you does it stay steady here based on you know very strong beats does it have eighth notes that want to move forward come back kind of thing um, 
And I would never, never feel like we accelerate to the end of the phrase or slow down to the end of a phrase. Always make sure it goes back to that baseline at the end. Almost think about it as like a, a metronome at the very middle, uh, where if we go too far, then we feel like we have momentum going into the rest or into the next section. If we slow down, then we have to make up the momentum going into the next section. So hopefully that helps. Um, another question from Connor. What are your thoughts about phrasing in solo Bach? Do you focus your ideas around the harmonic structure or your own interpretation of the lines? Maybe a combination of the both. Um, I would say I don't have a ton of thoughts on phrasing in solo Bach just because I, I feel like everybody approaches a little bit differently. Um, for me, it definitely has to do with the music. I, and that's maybe one of the things that I find so interesting about music in general is like, we're just kind of servants of the music We're we're playing this music, but it's really not our music. It's box music. So the things that I look out for are especially progressions, harmonic progressions, um, and sequences. The main things are sequences. Um, so if it's going down or going up a sequence, I let that, uh, kind of inherently, uh, help my interpretation as well. If, for example, there's a motive that's repeating. For example, what comes to mind is the Bach second suite prelude. The da 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 da. We have this ascending triad every time. Even if it's kind of built in the music, it's almost like a, a a word search where we need to find where that motive is and bring it out a little bit more. Um, so for me, I would say I'll actually amend my statement. It's mainly to do with what's written in Bach, kind of thing, and I never try to. I don't know, I, Bach is one of those where I don't try to listen to recordings of Bach um, when I'm learning a new Bach or bringing it back just because I feel like it's so, it's a blank canvas because we don't really know any of the phrasings or the markings or anything besides just the actual notes because it's Anna Magdalena's. So I, I try to approach it with a clean head every time and see if it makes sense harmonically, melodically, and sequentially. So hopefully that helps. And, oh, it looks like we're almost at 7.30. But, yeah, if you uh, have any questions, keep them going. I guess the, the main thing that I could impress upon people for, for the audition experience is just, obviously, we need to get to a... Ooh, we have in the practice room series. Okay, I'll, I'll make this very quick. Um, go into what makes what you view your strengths are, exploit those and show the committee why we should hire you kind of thing. And I found that both on both sides of the screen. So that's the main thing. Uh, I have more questions to answer. So uh, maybe expansion on that in a little bit. Um, so in the practice room, why do you practice? What drives you and motivates you and anything that helped you in the pandemic? Why do I practice? Because I want to sound not terrible. <laughs> Is the, That's the... Um, kind of point blank answer. I practice because I, and I kind of touched on this a little bit during the talk, but when I'm, when I'm playing, I don't want to be focusing on the stuff that I can't do or the stuff that uh, I'm not prepared to do. And so I practice to make sure that all of the stuff, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, everything like that. I also practice to explore new ways of phrasing, to explore new sounds, to kind of broaden my horizon because I feel like if I stop practicing, I stagnate and I I actually I get into a little bit of a funk where like I feel like I'm not really I don't know, I feel like I'm not really doing justice to music the fact that I get to play music uh, day in and day out. Uh, it's kind of a responsibility to make yourself the best artist possible so you can um, convey what you want to convey during the performance rather than, you know, worrying about, am I going to miss this shift or not? Um, anything that helped during the pandemic? Uh, yes. Taking lessons again. You're never too old to stop taking lessons. I've had this job for like eight years now. I still, uh, whenever I go to mainly Mozart in San Diego, uh, to play with them. I play for my teacher out there, uh, Ron Leonard. He's one of the biggest influences in my life. And, um, he always sets me straight in the sternest and nicest way possible. I still play for Eric Kim, uh, who is my teacher during the pandemic, getting somebody to kind of uh, bust your ass a little bit. Um, it's it's good because we, we can, when you have a job, it can get a little bit 
you can get comfortable. And so you should never be comfortable. You should always be looking to become better. Um, yes. What is the first thing you do on the cello every day? Uh, tune. Because <laughs> what's the point in practicing intonation or playing a scale if you aren't in tune with yourself? Even though there's that old... I think it's a Heifetz story about where somebody's violin was out of tune one week and the next week he like took it and like tuned down a bunch of random strings and expect them to play Tchaikovsky violin concerto perfectly um, because it's going to happen in performance. Um, but I would say the, the long bows and the costmen are the two that I make sure I do every day at the beginning to warm up because also when I, I, I don't like diving straight into a piece of music just because if I do that, I'm worrying about warming up instead of worrying about practicing the music. So I feel like it's actually counterintuitive to to do anything other than warm me up first. What is on my music stand right now? My computer. <laughs> uh, it's a Brahms double. Uh, so I have Brahms double in a couple weeks, and then we have an opening gala concert, which is a, a dance themed program. So we have Bolero, unfortunately. Uh, we have La Valse. We have um, well, it's Blue Danube. We're collaborating with the local troupe. So practicing that for rehearsals in two days, Brahms double, and then after that, some music for some upcoming weeks. Um, how do you go about deepening your musical imagination? Uh, listening to as many recordings as possible. When a new recording comes out, just go and listen to it. Exploring pieces by living composers, um, especially pieces that you've never heard about, composers you've never met, you've never played for. Um, and then using that mindset that you approach those pieces with to look at the pieces that you play every year or you know every couple of years use that mindset to go and approach those pieces in a new way because i feel like one of the one of the things that would make me saddest in my life about playing would be if i play dvorak and share for example the same way every single time then it's unfortunately it sounds rather extreme to say but it's no no different than for example a factory worker is stamping the numbers on a license plate kind of thing um which nothing wrong with that but it doesn't even scratch the surface of what we can do so that's uh the biggest thing um what is your favorite way to change things up and get new ideas a kind of similar sort of idea to that question um i also like to <laughs> i mean it's a practice technique but also sometimes it, it has worked out a couple times where you add accents where you displace the agogic accents so if you're playing a piece where you know it's on one and three two and four weaker then accent two and four make one and three weaker accent three but not one etc moving through that idea um and so um that's <laughs> it actually worked out a couple of times where it actually i liked that idea better maybe not as extreme as that idea um but yeah so that's the thing is just basically uh, changing up what you do in the practice room, making sure you're always practicing in new ways as well, because it might unlock something new. Um, in your mind, what is it that makes an effective practice session? You get to the end of a session and you feel like you can still keep going. The thing that I learned quickly about, especially auditions, because there are so many excerpts, is um, you can mindlessly go through a lot of things, but not really get a lot done. And so, for example, with Brahms double and having a full ISO schedule and I teach a few hours a week too and dealing with everything, taking care of my dog as well uh, and all their life responsibilities, making sure that you know exactly what you want to do in the practice room for whatever, like I was saying, like 15 minutes in between classes or half an hour, even like if you have three hours, what do you want to accomplish there? Instead of like playing it through every day, that doesn't really accomplish anything, even if you're at the point of being ready for a performance. So choose a couple, very manageable, more manageable than you think that you can handle, and just focus on that, focus on um, correcting a couple of ideas there that you think need correcting. So for example, if there's a shift and a phrasing issue that you want, make sure that you correct those all the way before moving on don't be okay with accepting something subpar with that um even if it's just to get to the next thing it's better to spend more time on one thing before you move on to the next thing even if it means you don't get to that uh that next thing you need to get to until the the next day then fix that thing in the same sort of way so it's better to fix it all the way um 
What are the best ways to prevent injury? Um, getting rid of tension is the first way. Uh, it also sounds kind of odd to say, but going to the gym is the best way for me. I had a lot of tendonitis when I first started because I wasn't used to playing that much, that intensely all the time, especially um, when you're in a principal position, you always have to be on, you always have to be ready to go, you always have to be leading. So it's actually a lot more physically taxing than just, for example, practicing or even performing uh, a normal concert because you never get to have an off switch because let's say you have an off switch during some rest, then you might stop counting, you might come in wrong kind of thing. So you always had to be focusing on that. So what I found is I, I had, um, and it's just unique to me, I had, um, what's it called? Uh, nerve entrapment going to my other two fingers. I had tendonitis on my triceps tendon and um, I forgot what this tendon is right here. But there, and I found that it was because my body was compensating because I have little chicken arms. Um, and so if I could help develop, it doesn't have to be much, but I, if you can develop those muscles around there, that's also the same with practicing. Uh, you can also do that to a certain extent. Then it takes a lot of stress off of the smaller muscles and the tendons and ligaments and everything in order to keep them healthy. And that's the first thing. Um, making sure you take regular practice breaks. I went to Perlman Music Program when I was younger. Um, and they advocated for a 50-10 approach where you practice 50 minutes, take 10 minutes break, practice 50 minutes, 10 minute break, etc. Um, and so I, I still, I, I do an hour now, but I always make sure to take at least 10, 15 minute break. And then I don't try to, unless I have to, you know, get everything done. I try not to practice four hours in a row, for example, because I try to get, uh, ideally four or so hours to practice a day in between everything. Um, and so if I could, I would do two hours with a 10, 15 minute break in the middle and then two hours with a 10, 15 minute break in the middle to allow yourself to just rest. Stretch, chiropractor also help. Um, what's the best balance between technique and repertoire? You can't play repertoire without having a very solid technique. So I, I mean, I even still work on etudes. I have been working through some of the popper book um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be you don't have to strive to have perfect technique but always be striving to have better technique um, just because if you have the best technique you possibly can it makes everything else in repertoire a lot easier um, so i would say for me personally i spent at least like you know the first ideally the first 20 to 30 minutes just doing technique warm up that kind of stuff um, and making sure it's as efficient as possible as well how do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? Uh, having a calendar where you write out where you start a piece and where you want it to be by a certain date. Uh, for example, Brahms Double is where I need it to be right now. I'm playing a chamber concert in three, no, when is it? It's about a week away or so. <laughs> As I say that, you should write it down. Um, there's a chamber concert in about a week that I have to learn Dvorak bass quintet, a Jesse Montgomery piece, and then a modern piece as well. Um, so I'm gonna start that tomorrow and the next day. I've never played the Dvorak before. I played the Montgomery before. So just kind of knowing about how much time it takes to bring certain things back. Um, if it's a new piece for a chamber concert, I've been listening to the Dvorak bass quintet a lot because I need to get in my ears kind of similar to what I was talking about with orchestra auditions. Um, and for the most part, it's, you know, I just start it and I make sure I have it all the way ready to go at least three or four days before the performance. And that's the thing is like, we're playing new uh, new pieces every week and it does get easier as you, you know, have more years on the job because you start to realize, oh, I've played, you know, Tchaikovsky six before, it'll take maybe three days to bring it back instead of having to do it for like two weeks kind of thing to first play it. So that's, that's the main thing with that is just kind of, and it, it, you get better with it once you, once you have more experience with, you know, how often do you need to, bring back pieces. Um, how has your practicing evolved over the years or even recently? Is there anything that has surprised you? Um, I've started to use the metronome a lot more, which Mr. Leonard, uh, my teacher from LA, would yell at me for not using it um, <laughs> sooner, but he once, uh, I was practicing something and, or I playing it in the lesson and I, he asked if I practiced it with a metronome and I said yes and he said, well, was it on? So practicing a lot more with the metronome is first, um, doing a lot more um, slow but 
uh, intentional practice. So making sure that if you are playing a fast passage, making sure kind of doing the grouping and practicing bringing the grouping up to speed rather than doing the entire passage. So kind of clumping things up a little bit more. Um, and is there anything that has surprised you? Um, actually, this this <laughs> this sounds kind of weird to say, but I've been surprised about how much um, better my sight reading has gotten on the job. And I also attribute that to how I practice because when I practice uh, in these little chunks, when you go to learn a new piece of music, your mind automatically scans for these new chunks and you're able to break up a new piece a lot easier rather than look at a new piece of music and be like, well, shit, that's a page of just really difficult stuff. Uh, I can now like break it up into different chunks and uh, it's a lot more manageable then. Uh, last two questions. We have one more from Dylan. How do I know if my instrument is holding me back and not just me? How much does your instrument matter in an audition or competition setting? Um, that's a tricky question. For me, I get very uh, obsessed with making sure my cello is the best it can be. Um, I never obviously switch cellos. I always go with what I'm comfortable with, but I make sure that it's fully adjusted. My strings are relatively fresh, my bow hair is relatively fresh, all that fun stuff. Because I, it's one of those where you want to not be thinking about your cello as you're playing. And so I would say it gets to the point where you feel like your cello is holding you back, where you try, I mean, if we try a Strat or try a Guarnieri, obviously things are gonna be way easier. But if you try the next step up cello and you find a cello that is realistic, I would say, um, that you feel like you don't have to worry about these little things without having really many trade-offs at all. I think that's one of the biggest things for me. Um, that's kind of where I began my cello search to find this, I don't know, I'm pointing over that's a tree, um, where I found the cello that I have now. Is, uh, it's an unknown Florentine cello. But before that, I was finding myself having a lot of injuries, having a lot of, like, where I had to work extra hard to get the sound that I wanted. And then I... Uh, played on a, what was it? It was a Guarneri cello at Banafushi uh, a while back that instantaneously, I know I said don't compare it to Guarneri's, but um, instantly was better. And so I realized I needed a new cello ASAP because I was getting injured. And so I started to look for cellos having that very specific sound in mind. And I finally found one, luckily, <laughs> at a not insane price. Um, so that definitely helped. So I would say it does matter to a certain extent, but I think what matters more, like for example, if you go out and borrow a Grafiller, that's great. You're not used to playing the Grafiller, so it's something to get used to. I would say uh, as long as you're comfortable with the instrument and feel like you can do everything that you can on the instrument, um, if you are thinking that it's holding you back, most likely then it is. Um, but you do need concrete proof saying that, you know, this is the type of child that I want to take me to the next level kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the main thing is just making sure that you're comfortable with the cello because I think that's the thing that we can notice more on a committee is, you know, if you're fighting against your cello or you're not really used to the cello, we can actually notice that more than if, you know, it's a not great cello. Like somebody won our audition a couple auditions ago on a just unknown Czech cello. I think it was a Czech cello, German cello. Like it wasn't anything fantastic, but like he still sounded fantastic. He was able to still sound fantastic despite the fact it wasn't a great cello kind of thing. Um, so hopefully that answers it. Uh, question from Sasha: What hurts for forty four forty two? Do you tune to when it comes to daily practice? Is it different than working with the orchestra or any of the chamber musicians? Um, orchestra, our orchestra goes to four forty. Um, I, maybe this is giving a Freudian glimpse into my head about where my mind's at, but um, if I'm preparing for an audition, I always make sure to tune to whatever they say on the packet. Uh, let's say they say, you know, so-and-so orchestra tunes to 441, then I'll make sure that I tune all the time to 441 because I find it's a lot easier to adjust down when you play with other people in the orchestra to adjust as you play and you also hear the A from the orchestra. Um, so 
rather than an audition, where it's like you're just playing by yourself, you have to be in tune with yourself, so you have to make sure that your intonation there is a lot more solid in terms of being used to the frequency there. Um, I also, and maybe this will make me sound bad, I can't tell a huge difference if somebody plays 440 versus 442. I can mainly tell a difference if they don't, if they aren't in tune with themselves uh, or not in tune with other people. Um, because I think it, for me, it also doesn't really matter too much. I know, for example, I think it's more of like the, the oboist variety and clarinetist variety that focus on certain scents and hurts a lot more. Um, so yeah, I think that brings us to the end of our cello chat. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you all have any questions, um, just reach out to me on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, send me a message. I'd be happy to talk to any of you to answer any further questions. If anything comes up, I'm also happy to help with that. Um, just, it's been a real pleasure. I think with auditions, it's, it's tricky. Um, but making sure that you, uh, you always know you can ask for help from anybody, whether it's myself, any other principal musician, any people in an orchestra, your teachers, uh, we're all in this together. And so um, thanks so much for having me and uh, I will talk to you guys sometime soon. Maybe not. <laughs>